Solar freaking roadways. What are they? They're solar freaking roadways. Solar freaking roadways. I mean, what a great idea to replace all of the roads in America with smart technology. It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels, smart microprocessing, interlocking, hexagonal solar units. And they can generate electricity from the sun. And they can make the roads light up with different patterns such that our world would seem like Tron. LED lights under your feet, it's gonna look like freaking Tron out there. But real, because this is the real world. Whoa. And yeah, they've raised over a million dollars for this on Indiegogo. What possible downsides could such a project have? Well, there's an old saying that if things sound too good to be true, then they probably are. Let me explain. You see, the main thing that roads do, the one property that they must have and really can't compromise on, is they must durably provide traction for heavy rubber-wheeled vehicles in all weathers. Now that's actually a very demanding requirement, and so, as you might expect, roads frequently need to be repaired. Indeed, as everyone in America will know, summer is basically road mending season. And to anyone who's actually seen the bill for these things, they'll know that even cheap highway repair is bloody expensive. So now, rather than just merely destroying road service, which pretty much has optimum requirements for this, they want to replace it with these expensive high-tech glass bricks. Well, let's start with the obvious. What are the traction properties? Well, they claim the traction properties are okay, and I can believe that. You know, rubber on glass, that's probably not too bad. However, I suspect that the traction properties when this gets wet or dirty might be somewhat subpar. They're covered with a new tempered glass material that has been designed and tested to meet all impact, load, and traction requirements. And I further suspect that driving on glass bricks in wet weather will be suicidal compared to driving on blacktop because blacktop or asphalt has a lot of spiky areas that provide traction and also make the material quasi-porous, allowing the water to drain away from the very top of the road surface. But they claim that they've made a glass surface so rough that it ripped the boot off the British pendulum tester they were using to test traction, which would mean that a car would easily stop on it. Well, yeah, I've got my doubts about that. I mean, firstly, because hard cheese on such a pendulum tester would also probably have comparable traction properties. But that doesn't mean that you could stop a car going at 80 miles an hour on it. Secondly, even if you could roughen up the glass surface enough to give suitable traction properties to stop a pendulum tester in the lab once, that's still almost pointless in that you want a road surface that you can reliably stop on in the wet for years. And fundamentally, glass is a pretty soft material. How long do you think it will be before it's worn smooth? And what will its traction properties be like then? But, but they have a demo where they drive a tractor on this test bed. Well, uh, good for them. But look, the tractor is tiny really really tiny and it's driven a few yards once let's see how this fares after having one of those big tanker trucks driving over this for a few years and see how it fares but more importantly have you ever wondered why we don't make roads out of hexagons anyway the first problem is that as tiles get too big they tend to crack in the middle and then, of course, the water goes through those cracks and can slowly waterlog and erode away the foundations of the road. And that's one of the reasons why things like asphalt is great, because they provide a waterproofing surface that keeps the road waterproof and stops it getting washed away by the rain. And secondly, as a vehicle will roll across such a tile, you'll get differential loading, which will cause the tiles to slowly work their way loose. Sure, these processes can take days, months or even years but these are some of the reasons why you've never seen a freeway made out of tiles look blacktop has very good properties for making roads from it's essentially a waste product from the oil industry we've been working really hard to use as many recycled materials as we can we'd love to hire recycling experts to make it even greener 
I'm very, you know, environmentally conscious. Good, because solar roadways use as much recycled material in their production as possible. Yeah, I've got to admit, that really stinks. First of all, you can't make clear glass from melting ground up colored glass. Secondly, using ground up colored glass would be stupid if optical transmission is something that you care about. And there's absolutely no way these folks have the facilities for large scale glass melting, recasting into different shapes and annealing. Julie's a therapist, I'm an engineer. We have zero marketing skills. We've never sold anything. We don't know where to go from here. So. What is this couple doing shoveling ground up colored glass into a wheelbarrow? We've been working really hard to use as many recycled materials as we can. Plus, it's bloody obvious at this point that they have no clue whatsoever that asphalt is one of the most recycled materials ever. With up to 99% of it being recycled. I don't believe we're going to have the ability to build asphalt roads in 50 years. That's one of the reasons why it's relatively cheap. And now you're going to replace that with these uber expensive glass tiles. That, which means, of course, that your building and repair costs are going to go through the roof. Glass has some other downsides, which I'll come to shortly. But this could power the whole United States, right? Well, there's 25,000 square miles of road surfaces, parking lots and driveways in the lower 48 states. If we covered that with solar panels, just a 15% efficiency, we produce three times more electricity than this country uses on an annual basis. Okay, let's take those numbers, 25,000 square miles, which is about 60 billion square meters. And a meter square of nothing special, half inch thick tempered glass costs about $300. That means that just the cost of the glass, that's not the cost of all of the electronics that goes into these things, you know, the microprocessors, the printed circuit boards, the Wi-Fi and the LEDs. That's not the cost of the power system. You know, all of the cables and the such like that go into this. That's not the cost of the solar cells. And that's not the cost of the manpower to bring all of these high-tech features together in a manufactured product. Just the glass costs. That's just the glass. Nothing else would cost you about $20 trillion. That's give or take about 10 times the federal budget. But, but let's leave the technical details aside. What about this powering the country? Well, think about it a little more. First of all, even if you did bankrupt the entire country by building such a system, it's only going to give you power while the sun is up. And of course, there's the critical problem with energy transport. At the moment, one of the most efficient ways of transporting power is through high voltage alternating current lines. You know, those big power lines. And even at that, your losses in transporting your power are about 7%. And that's pretty much as good as it gets. You would now not only need to replace all of the road surfaces, but would have the formidable infrastructure of changing the few volts you get off the photovoltaics into high voltage alternating current and then build a high voltage alternating current transport system that would go along every road in America. I mean, just think of the material that would take. Just think about the metal in the wiring alone and not just under the road. I mean, let me give you some ballpark figures here. High voltage lines alone cost about as much per mile as adding a completely new mile of freeway lane. And you would need something like that down all the roads in America. Plus, the roadways have two channels that form what's called a cable corridor that runs concurrently with the roadways themselves. One part houses electrical cables, meaning power lines, data lines, fiber optics, and high-speed internet, which replaces the need for telephone poles and hanging wires that can be damaged during storms causing power outages. Which would all be fantastic if it weren't for the fact that burying power transmission lines costs about 10 times what it costs to have overhead transmission lines. And even those clock in at about a million dollars per mile because otherwise generating power that you cannot effectively transport anywhere is essentially just a expensive exercise in futility this is why power stations are a pretty cost-effective way of doing these things you have a power station and a limited number of high voltage power lines to transport that power to a substation which steps it down to civilian type voltages 
and you don't need an infrastructure the size of the US road network. Have you any idea of the size of the infrastructure you are proposing to build? Look, America can barely keep its highways in order, let alone maintain a power grid the size of the US road system. And on top of this, all of their road engineers would now need to be electricians as well. But they have lights on that can do really cool things, right? Every panel has a series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. And it's a cool idea, lighting up the roads in America such that they would look like Tron. LED lights under your feet, it's gonna look like freaking Tron out there. But real, because this is the real world. Whoa. Imagine a highway road lighting up ahead of you. How much safer it would be to drive at night. Well, maybe. But I think I've got a better idea. Yes, better. You see, what you really want is just a way of lighting the area of road that the car is on. Now, sure, we could put lights in all of the roads in America, which would require an equally large power system. Or well, we could, let me just think about this. Yeah, yeah, I think this will work. We could just put lights on the cars. And then we only light the bit of the road that we're interested in. And even better, we can put some cat's eyes in the roads such that you don't need any power for the road whatsoever and it just lights up the part of the road that you're interested in. Plus, let me just say as an astronomer that the light pollution in the modern world is already atrocious and that I like seeing the stars at night and I don't want night on planet Earth to look like a permanently lit up cheesy disco. Every panel has a series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. Well, let's start with the obvious. There is no way, none at all, that you would be able to see these LEDs under the full hard sunlight. You know, when these solar panels are meant to be generating the electricity. So here I have some very bright LEDs, which I can have in white, blue, green, or red. And now I have them out in the sunlight for red, green, and blue, and white. So as you can see, once you get into the full light of day, it really isn't quite the same thing as doing it at night. Just a little bit of shade. There we go, just about to see it now, because we've got some uh, cloud. But as for having those to drive on, you've got to be kidding me. So how are people meant to drive on these roads in the day, essentially without road markings? Indeed, the only way you could get patterns like this is if you were to, say, put liquid crystal displays into the roads, which would be so much more cooler than LEDs. Plus, you could add touchscreen technology, which would mean that the whole US road system would basically become one giant smartphone. I mean, just think about the apps you could get on a smartphone the size of the United States. I mean, sure, the liquid crystal displays might stop the light from getting to the solar cells, but... Solar freaking roadways. What are they? They're solar freaking roadways. But taking a step back to reality for a second, first of all, we only ever see these LEDs close up in the dusk from above. <laughs> Let's be real. What do you think the visibility of these things will be like when you're looking at them at a very shallow angle in the road in the full daylight? <laughs> Speaking of which, so what if you can change the patterns? Almost all roads do not need the patterns changed on them like this. And actually putting lights in all of the roads just so you can change them for the very rare occasion when they might be needed is a very inefficient way of doing things. Indeed, like this, hard signs are a much more cost-effective way of doing things than building lights into all areas of the road. Now, sure, there are some urban roads where having some dynamically lit road signs or roadways would be cost effective, like the dynamic traffic control measures they have employed in many cities already. But I have real doubts for if in those roads it would be worth putting solar panels in as well. They also seem to really like the idea of solar powered car lots. Country, just parking lots and major fast food chains, for instance, you could use this to go all the way to Florida from here. This is part of what they got the money from the Department of Transport for, and it's also part of what they want the crowdfunding money for. 
Now, this does have some advantages in that the wear that you get off traffic in Carlot is far less. But hey, let's be real here. The renderings that they have of their solar powered car parks. So now we have all these great ideas, right? We have, we hire our daughter's friend who's a graphic illustrator to do some drawings for us, do some animations. Here's a panel all assembled, the lights being tested. This is an interpretation of what it looked like. The renderings that they have of their solar powered car parks have almost no cars in them, which is kind of the whole point of car parks in the first place. You know, mostly during the day when the sun is up and the solar panels could generate electricity, they're going to be full of cars, which means there's no point in covering the car park with solar cells. And then it's empty at night when there is no sun, which means there's no point in covering the car park in solar cells. I mean, seriously, how long did these people think about this? This is exactly the kind of over-the-horizon thinking that has brought Idaho's own solar roadways to national and world prominence. No kidding. The economy is in the toilet. Do you realize how many thousands of jobs this could create and sustain? Talk about a hypodermic adrenaline shot to the heart of the manufacturing and infrastructure sector. We can all benefit from this public-private partnership, which will create jobs and lessen our dependence on fossil fuels. That's for it creating jobs. Yeah, I'm sure it would. But then again, so would building a bridge to nowhere. Or maybe more accurately, a gold-plated bridge to nowhere. The real question is, is that a cost-effective way of spending the money or bankrupting the country? And I'm really not convinced that it is. You know, maybe something more practical, like repairing the existing road system. Then, of course, there are parts of this presentation that are straight, pure, unrefined bullshit. You see, roads are actually fairly good thermal absorbers than almost anything else. No more useless asphalt and concrete just sitting there baking in the sun. Roads are collecting heat anyways. And that's why roads in summer get very hot. Now they're proposing using these high-tech bricks to melt the snow. Those in the north, the panels use energy they collect to power elements to keep the surface temperature a few degrees above freezing. Oh my. Did you just say that in the north, like where there's not much sun, in winter, when there's even less sun, during a snowstorm, where then there's even less sun, they're going to use that solar energy to heat things to melt the snow? They're heated. No more ice and snow on roads causing traffic delays, accidents, and injury. No more shoveling your driveway and sidewalk. No salt corroding your car or wasting tax money on snow removal. And you can ride your bike or drive your motorcycle all year round. Whoa! Which is just grade 7 bullshit. It takes a huge amount of energy to change ice into water. That is, to melt ice. That's why we use snow plows and not snow melters. That is, the physical energy required to move the snow to the side of the road is far less than the amount of energy to melt that snow. Now, the best amount of energy you're going to harvest from these bricks is essentially what you would get if you paint the bricks black, or most likely blacktop road. And no, even with the best energy harvest you can get off a blacktop road, it's still nowhere near as efficient to melt a good snowfall in winter. But what I hear you say, they're actually talking about heating the roads. Seriously, heating the roads with heating elements in their bricks? Are you kidding me? It takes a huge amount of energy to melt ice. It takes as much energy to turn ice at zero degrees into water at zero degrees. That is, just the energy to melt a unit mass of ice requires the same amount of energy as heating water at zero degrees Celsius up to water at 70 degrees Celsius. That's three quarters of the way to boiling. I mean, think about that. Rather than just moving the snow to the side of the road, they are proposing using as much energy over the entire US road system as heating that water up from zero degrees Celsius to three quarters the way to boiling. And that's assuming that this is a 100% efficient system where they lose no heat to either the sub-zero temperature of the road foundation or the atmosphere. The heating elements will keep the road surface snow and ice free all winter long. So some ballpark numbers. Let's just take this one single freeway from New York City to Washington. A couple of hundred miles or kilometers, that sort of distance. 
And let's say the average snowfall for this region is about two feet a year. That's about two thirds of a meter. And you go through the numbers and you find that just the energy bill for just that one road alone would be about two million dollars per year. This is the thing again and again. They say this is just some inventor guy and his wife. And that pretty much shows through in their knowledge base, which seems to be mostly electronics. They don't have a clue about thermodynamics, energy transport, or road construction. Julie's a therapist. I'm an engineer. We have zero marketing skills. We've never sold anything. We don't know where to go from here. So We've come this far with just the two of us and a couple of part-time volunteers. To enable our vision, we'll need to build manufacturing facilities in every state in the U.S. and nearly every country in the world. And of course, Roads are very dirty places. They get covered in dirt and oil. And a solar panel covered in dirt and oil really ain't gonna generate that much electricity. And all of that dirt combined with the traffic movement is abrasive stuff. It will just grind away a relatively soft material like glass. I mean, think about it this way. Dirt is basically really small rocks. Now you're gonna grind that dirt against glass under the wheels of say a, a 20 ton tractor trailer. What do you think is going to happen? Yup, this is just gonna grind down the glass and make it smoother and slippier and more opaque. Really not so sure that these bricks are gonna have a long life expectancy as a road surface. And of course, their calculations assume that the solar panels under the road are gonna be as efficient as a top range solar plant. If we covered that with solar panels, with just a 15% efficiency, we produce three times more electricity than this country uses on an annual basis. And I think that's a little optimistic. Look, currently solar farms, where they have essentially uninterrupted daily sun, you know, in places like California, where it's actually pretty good. You build your power station near where the electricity is going to be used, such that you cut down on your transport losses and the cost of building the infrastructure. In deserty areas in America, you typically have no shortage of places to build something like that, because it's the desert, and not many people live in the desert. Plus, they are relatively easy to maintain, because you didn't build a road surface over the top of it. I mean, in many ways, a far better variant of this plan would just be to build a giant shed over the top of the roads or on top of the car park and then put the solar panels on that. You get no losses from the bricks being dirty and absorbing the light. You get to angle your solar panels such that they're much more efficient. Something, of course, that you can never do when they're actually built into the road surface. Plus, you now have much easier uninterrupted access to your solar panels because they're not under the road. Plus, you can now downlight the roads and it allows you much easier access to the blacktop. Plus, all of your lights now point downwards under a shed, which will cut down on light pollution. Plus, now all of your roads are covered and they won't get slippy because they won't get wet. Well, for that matter, if it's over the top of a car park, your car will stay dry. Plus, now you can keep all of your road workers because you're still maintaining the existing blacktop technology. And at this point, you've just got to be honest that it would be far more efficient to just put your solar panels along the side of the road rather than under it. So why is there all this buzz around this inventor and his wife? Well, fundamentally, I think it's because people think that it's a really cool idea. However, it is notable that the Department of Transport only gave them a few uh, smallish innovation grants and nothing afterwards. Early last year, we saw the United States Department of Transportation put out a solicitation for some kind of paving material that could pay for itself over its lifetime. <clears throat> Excuse me. We applied for it and we got it. It was a phase one research grant. But frankly, most of these folks who are excited about this don't have the slightest clue about the technical challenges of building a road or transporting energy or for that matter why we currently use the materials that we do this is basically the thorium powered car all over again if you could make one it would be super cool you could drive for a hundred years on just eight grams of thorium if you ignore the minor technical detail that it's currently technologically impossible and that it's never likely to be technologically possible, then it's a great idea. It's kind of like saying, you know, what if we could build a pogo stick that could get us to the moon? 
Well, if we could, then it would be really cool. It would be a cheap, reusable way of getting to the moon. This is exactly the kind of over-the-horizon thinking that has brought Idaho's own solar roadways to national and world prominence. However, a few back of the envelope calculations will show you that it's just impossible. The materials simply don't exist. Now, sure, the march of technology and knowledge can make some of these things possible, but a pogo stick that can get you to the moon is just outside of that envelope. Similarly here, fundamentally, the materials simply do not exist. Look, everything here basically depends on getting material as good as asphalt for topping the surface of the road that is optically clear. We're not talking about something you can park your car on for 10 minutes or something that you can run a single lap test on. We're talking about something you can drive your car on for 20 years and have it still be optically clear with the same physical properties as blacktop. And that's the core problem. This material does not exist, nor is it ever likely to exist in a cost-effective form, let alone one that you can make out of some few shovels of crappy ground-up colored glass. And this point isn't even remotely addressed in any of their material nor is there any attempt to address how they expect to transport the power that would be generated from these solar panels to a point where it could be used. Now, invariably, when I put a video like this up, people will claim that I'm simply a pawn for this industry or that, and put simply, no. No, I'm not, and I'll tell you why. These videos are openly supported by supporters of this channel through Patreon. And it's they who allow me to operate completely independently of any vested corporate interests. It's that that allows me the freedom to call out popular or well-sold bullshit wherever it's put forward. No matter if it's NASA's claims about extraterrestrial life or powdered alcohol or thorium-powered cars or solar-powered roads. You know, this sort of investigative, scientifically literate reporting that you wish the mainstream media actually did. And it's that independence that allows me to say that this stinks. A high-tech glass road made out of garbage with no stop tests. Seriously, if you believed in the properties of this paving, just do an emergency stop of some sort on it. I mean, isn't that the obvious proof of the pudding? Which, curiously, everyone seemed to overlook. My guess is that even at modest speeds, this would structurally destroy the paving and the electronics. And this is long before you worry about the long-term durability or considerations about power transport. Sorry, but what you heard here was not the voice of vested corporate interests, but a reasoned argument, solidly based on facts, telling you that, sadly, something that sounds too good to be true is...